Hello, everyone. <laughs> Happy Sunday. Welcome to Yoga Church. So, Atta Yoga Nushasanam, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodaha Taradrashtu Swarupe Vastaram. You know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yoga is the practice of being present. When we're present, we join the consciousness into the heart space and we avoid the fluctuations of the mind. When we do this, we view reality with less distortion. We see things as they truly are and we remember who we are and we stand in our power. So, um, so let's start that way. So we'll start by coming present. So take a moment and just close your eyes. So maybe you're here physically, but let's get here mentally, emotionally. So close your eyes, allow yourself to come into this room, to be here now, as Ram Das would say. Good. So using our first yogic tool, which is pranayama. So ujjayi, breath with sound. Tightening up the back of the throat just slightly as you breathe and just allow the sensations of your breath to fill up your body. This helps to calm the nervous system. So part of yoga church is understanding what I'm going to talk about, not just with the intellect of your mind, but with the wisdom of your heart. When those two things come into union, then we are practicing yoga. And then the lessons unfold. <laughs> and then we'll bring our palms together to heart center. And we'll start our session, sermon, class <laughs> with the sound of the universe. Inhale. Oh. Good. And then when you're ready, you can relax your posture and slowly open up your eyes. All right, welcome to Yoga Church. Uh, most of you, I'm pretty sure everybody knows me, but we also have some online audience. audience. So hi, I'm Erin. <laughs> um, so Yoga Church is something that came about, a couple people have asked me like, where did this concept come from? Or where did the Genesis come from? Um, and I've had so many people come to me and say, this is like my church, right? And just so you know, I'm not in competition with Christianity or the church system. <laughs> I'm not sure how I would fare there. Um, this is meant to be like a supplement, right? So whatever your spiritual beliefs, whatever your religion, denomination, any of that, like it will not be challenged here. Rather, it will be enhanced, Um what I'm talking about here today is lessons from some of the epic texts, some of the sacred scriptures, 
and um, putting them into modern application so that you can understand it with your mind as well as with your body. So, so yoga church is meant to be um, taking and decrypting some of those uh, yogic um, spiritual scriptures into modern day application. So, because it makes it more palatable. Like the way that I teach anatomy, it's anatomy becomes much more interesting when it applies directly to your body rather than looking at an anatomy chart and you're kind of like, all right, I guess that's my femur, that's my humerus, that's my skull. Okay, like I, I get that in concept. But when you really feel your muscles and you feel your bones, then you form a deep connection to it, right? So that's one of the beautiful things about yoga is yoga doesn't expect or ask you to, you know, like don't take my word for it. Feel it in your body, right? Let your body speak for itself. There's a phrase and it goes, kaya gatta vedana sati. So um, kaya gatta is from within the framework of the body. Vedana is the flow of and sati is awareness. So as I'm speaking <laughs> and as you're feeling the experience in your body, just notice what reigns true for you, right? And then that's your guide. I'm, a, I'm up here just kind of talking and, right, I might chant some mantra, but... Like ultimately your heart is your guide. So I've been teaching yoga teacher trainings for just about 10 years. Um, this is my 11th class that I'm guiding now. Um, woo -woo. <laughs> um, I opened up Thrive 10 years ago. And so I wanted to share the story of Thrive and kind of how it came about because um, it wasn't anything that was necessarily in my vision right away. So, and some people here have been with me for such a long time and love me so much. And I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, so I didn't necessarily want to own a studio. And here's the reason why. I love you guys. I love everyone that's here and I love Thrive. And it's made me grow in such ways that I never thought possible, like beyond the realm of what I thought was possible. Um but I was working in a wellness facility with an acupuncturist and we had it like a nice little thing going, you know, I had my little back room and I could come out and I can be in the public eye, but then I could go back and I could hide. And I like that because I was in control, right? There was one week, so I was working there for about four or five years. And there was one, one particular week where I had no less than three people come up to me and they said something like, um, well, I'll just wait till you open up your studio. Or like, I'll just, I'll, I'll get you when you're opening up your studio, wink, wink, nudge. And then there was like one more person. I'm like, are you guys like huddling up and like talking about this behind my back? Like, um, and then the biggest thing was I got on the phone with my dad and that same week he said, Aaron, I think it's time that you open up a yoga studio. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and that was shocking because I had been teaching English, which one of my students is here is from when I was teaching English, like feels like a lifetime ago. And when I said, dad, I think I'm going to try to make a living teaching yoga. And he was like, what? <laughs> How? <laughs> and um, at that time, I didn't know either. I didn't know how it'd work out, but it just felt right in my heart. And I had what's called Shraddha. So Shraddha is faith. Shraddha is when you have that feeling and you follow your heart. And I like to take sort of um, calculated risks. So I don't just like jump off like the, the Grand Canyon. I'm like, all right, let's see how this goes. It feels right in my heart. You have to check in with your brain once in a while, right? <laughs> Lest you get into trouble. Um, but I followed my heart and I made it work. Hi, Angie. So, um, you know, yoga absolutely changed my life. Um, you know, in the spirit of vulnerability, um, you know, I have a past. Certainly, if you look at the title of my first book, you can kind of guess what that is. Um, and I remember that the only place that I found peace was on my yoga mat. And that was just like doing postures. And then I found myself doing like weird breath that nobody had necessarily taught me. And I was like having weird sensations and like my nervous system. And, 
And then I remember laying on my mat one day and it just sort of like hit me like a lightning bolt. I was like, there's something more to this practice. <laughs> Imagine that. So then I enrolled in my first yoga teacher training and it was fine. It was kind of like basic, but it, it was, it was good. It was what I needed at the time. And then I got hungry for more. And then I haven't stopped and it's been mm, upwards of almost like 20 years. Here I am. Um, yoga has a beautiful system beyond the postures. So in the classical system of yoga, there's eight limbs. So the third limb is, does anybody know what the third limb is? Asana, right? Not to be confused with asana. That's different. That's where you go to sweat in a different way. <laughs> I was like connected. Actually in asana, you'll sweat. Um, so, you know, there's a third limb, but then there's these beautiful ethics restraints and observances. So the yamas are, are outside to inside, and then our niyamas are inside to outside. So the yamas are, my YTTs, what's the first yama? Ahimsa. Good. Second one is? Satya. Third is? Asana. Or uh, sorry, asteya. Yes, correct. And then fourth is? And fifth is? Good. So ahimsa is, um, there's a translation of it, which is nonviolence, you know, like don't inflict harm to those around you, but also don't inflict harm to yourself. But a further definition that I quite like is love and reverence. So like not only don't inflict violence, but also love and respect the people around you. And I really love that definition. Because, you know, if you've ever like had an argument with a friend or a romantic partner, like I did, I just said that like it's kind of neutral, but you didn't say it kindly. So ahimsa is love and reverence for yourself and those around you. Um, when we don't listen to the call that we have from within, so when we don't follow our dharma, we have to ask ourselves the question, why? So if our heart is calling for something and um, we don't follow it, is that kind? Um, the way that I teach yoga and the way that Matt teaches it as well, my partner over there, if you want to give a Miss America wave, is um, yoga, part of yoga is about action. So taking action in your life. Why do we do this practice? Well, some people might say, well, it makes me feel good. It makes my body feel good. Like I feel relaxed. That's great. But this is a sacred practice to where you are called to action. Kriya yoga. So action for our communities. Why do we go inward? Why do we try to go through this, you know, the eight limbs of yoga and ultimately reaching samadhi? Is it just to sit in a cave and just like enjoy enlightenment? I mean, that sounds great. That seems like a little bit selfish, right? Maybe just a little bit. The way I've always viewed yoga is to better ourselves so that we can serve our communities. I like to say that a, one of a yogi's greatest tools that they sharpen is their discernment, which is Viveka. Being able to navigate within fear, um, having the discernment to say what is good pain, what is not good pain, be able to navigate that so that we can slash what is not true, slash that illusion, and then show up for people in a big way to inspire them, to take action, to fight when we need to fight, be peaceful when we need to be peaceful, but have the wisdom to know the difference. Something like that sounds familiar to something. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a moment now Close your eyes, draw into your body, and ask yourself, like, what is yoga to me? When I'm connected to myself, how do I serve my community? And can I let go of the stories that prevent me from showing up in my life? 
And according to yogic thought, those stories or kleshas might be one of five categories. So you're going to start to hear my harmonium. And you're going to hear me singing a little ditty here. You can feel free to call and response to join in. And I'm going to explain afterwards what you're chanting. But I want you to feel it in your body first. And so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Avidya smita raga Vesha adhini vesha klesha Vidya smita raga Vesha adhini vesha klesha Let's go slow. Avidya Asmita Raga Dvesha Abhini Vesha Plesha 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 Vidya Smita Raga Vidya Smita Raga Vesha Apini Vesha Klesha Vidya Smita Raga Vesha Apini Vesha Klesha Avidya Smita Raga Dvesha Abhini Vesha Klesha Dvidya Smita Raga Dvesha Abhini Vesha Klesha All right, now we're going to go a little bit faster. Try to just sing along. So we're not going to do calm response, just singing along. Ready? Avidya smita raga, dvesha avhini vesha klesha, vidya smita raga, dvesha avhini vesha klesha, vidya smita raga. Vesha Abhini Vesha Klesha Vidya Smita Raga 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 Dvesha Ahini Ve, I'm doing on purpose. Avidya Smita Raga. Dvesha Ahini Vesha Klesha. Avidya Smita Raga. Avidya Smita Raga. Dvesha Ahini Vesha Klesha. Vidya Abhini Vesha Klesha Oh So breathe, keep your eyes closed. Kaya Gatta Vedana Sati. Experience 
those words from within the framework of your body before you intellectualize them just be with them see what your body has to say about the matter if you like you can take a simple mudra of taking your index and thumb together palms down this is yana mudra the mudra of knowledge of learning and of grounding. Mm. Breathe and allow the energy to flow through your body. Being intimate with that energy, being curious about it. Good. And then when you're ready, and slowly come back into this room, just in case you went somewhere cosmic. <laughs> um, so what were we chanting? The kleshas are the obstacles that we have in life. And some might say the obstacles that we have to happiness or santosh, which is contentment. So we place them in the order of priority. So the most important klesha to be aware of is avidya. So avidya, um, so when you have an ah in front of any Sanskrit word, it usually means the opposite of. So vidya, uh, reminiscent of like the Vedas, which means knowledge, wisdom, so avidya is the opposite of that. So it's like the lack of knowledge, the lack of wisdom. So when you have avidya, it's like you don't even know what you don't know to know. So that one is kind of like the blanket priority. Um, before I discovered yoga, and um, by the way, I, I discovered it in a very interesting um, way. Um, so I was a much different person when I was younger, as many of us were, right? Um, I was an angry martial artist. I was like a punk rocker. I might have some undertones of that still, a little rebellious. Um, but I was like rebelling, like without like rebel without a cause. And I caused myself a lot of suffering just for no reason at all. <laughs> well, maybe because I didn't know what to do with the anger inside of me. And so... Um, you know, my first experience with true yoga coming present was um, my dad was asking me, well, what do you want for Christmas? And I was in, I was living in Japan, actually. I was teaching English there. And I was like, I don't know. And I, I was like looking online. And all of a sudden, like Madonna got, this was back in her Ray of Light album. She got like super ripped. Like, remember that when she came out and she's like, I have six pack abs. I was like, yes. <laughs> I was like, I want to be like Madonna. So completely superficial reason and she was super into ashtanga yoga right so she even did the vande guru nam sharanada vinde so one of the songs on her ray of light album is the ashtanga opening mantra so um but i didn't know like any of that i was just like madonna has six pack abs she did something called ashtanga to do that so like get me a dvd of that so he sent me a dvd and the funny thing is, I don't even think it wasn't even Ashtanga yoga. It was like maybe it had some in there, but it was Shiva Ray. Oh, okay. She's not really an Ashtangi. I mean, she might have that background, but she doesn't really teach Ashtanga. So I was like, well, she looks pretty ripped. And I just, I don't know, I was like obsessed with the physical body. So I put in the DVD, right? Aged myself right there, DVD, right? I put in the USB port. <laughs> um, and I remember fast forwarding through like all the spiritual bullshit. I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, I'm not into that. I was like, all right, she's sweating. Here we go. Press play. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is like so aggressive. <laughs> it's like, again, like that angry martial artist, like I'm going to win the yoga. Arr! So so angry, <laughs> like so tense, like so opposite. If anybody was be like, damn, like <laughs> chill. So I went all the way through and, um, then she's like, all right, now lay down on the ground, 
Shavasana. And I was like, because I didn't like to sit still at that time. It was a waste of time to me. I needed to be productive. But she kind of tuckered me out enough to where I was like, all right, I guess I'll take like whatever this is. And I laid. And in that moment, I laid on the tatami mats in my Japanese apartment <laughs> and all of my pain disappeared in one moment. And I didn't know that life could be that way. I thought it was just managing myself, constant struggle and suffering um, to go from like the next pill to the next like binge and purge to the next like whatever else I got myself into. And in that moment, yoga taught me. And that was just like the little tiniest little mustard seed of Shraddha of faith that I showed up to beat myself up physically, just that. And then laying in it, I had my first awakening and that's when my journey began. So I woke up from Shavasana and of course, like the addictive mindset was like, Oh shit. Okay. I'm obsessed with yoga now. Everything's yoga. Like I want to do this every day. <laughs> like, it's like completely ass backwards, you know? Um, that being said, I do think that obsession has its place. Like when you get really obsessed with something in the beginning and you're, it just tickles your brain in a certain way. And so I just started feeling better and I stopped binging and purging, um, as much. And then I stopped like drinking so much. And then it sort of started me on this path. And so when I came to my mat that one day, and then I decided I was going to take a yoga teacher training, um, sign up for one, went through it. Then I've been on the path since. So Avidya, I didn't even know what I didn't know. <laughs> so I had to know something, you know, I had to touch that space of God within me or universe, however you want to call it nature, um, so that I can know that there was something different. Because otherwise, I would have just kept on the path I was on, which was not pleasant, by the way, if you didn't get that from my description of my very first yoga practice. Mm -hmm. So avidya. Avidya, it's important to know. And if you're kind of like, well, I don't know what I don't know that I don't know, go find a teacher. Go find a guru. Um, be around spiritually minded people. And you do that, at least in the beginning, you know, come take a yoga class. These things, like Community is so important read uh, sacred scripture, these things. So, you, so, and, and again, kaya gatta vedana sati, go by what speaks to your heart. That is like the little breadcrumb trail. That is like the little GPS, right? Your heart's like, yes. And you're like, oh, okay. I hear you at least a little bit. Let me listen to that. So the next klesha is asmita. So asmita is egoism, too much ego. Now, when we think of ego, a lot of times we think of like puffing up the chest, I puff up my eyebrows, like, like that I'm better than other people, right? I just walk around so egoic, right? That's what, I, that's what usually people think of with ego. Egoism is also thinking that you're less than people too, right? Because it's, you know. Um, they are so much more mighty than me. It's like your ego, it's kind of has like a different type of voice, but it's the ego is making you less than what you are. And you are amazing. Like I'm amazing. You're amazing. We're all amazing. But in this human experience, it's very easy to forget because there's compare contrast. There's a lot of stimulation and it distorts our vision, right? Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. The chitta vritti is not just the distortions of the mind. It's also like the electrical sensations of the body of too much emotion, too much emotion that you think is permanent. And so you overly associate with it. That is also a smita. So like this pain will never end. This pain will never end. It's like when you're in a, in a yin yoga pose, this pain will never end. This pain will never end. <laughs> oh, my hips are always going to be this way, right? Yeah. So, and then we lock ourselves up. That's egoism, right? We get too attached to certain things. That's egoism as well. There's a, um, I have like so many translations of the yoga sutras, probably at least like 15. <laughs> um, there's one um, by a yogic nun. And she talks about how she was walking with her yogic master 
And she started like, yeah, she's like putting herself down about like a mistake that she made. She's like, oh, and I was so stupid and I couldn't. And he stopped her and he said, how egoic of you. And she was, you know, surprised, shocked because she felt like she was like prostrating herself in front of him. How egoic of you to think that you're so perfect that you're not afforded a mistake. And that always stuck with me. I really like that line. Yeah. It's like, how egoic am I then? I'm not giving myself a chance to make a mistake. You know, how often are we so hard on ourselves? You know, we put the weight of the world on our shoulders, like Atlas. Mm -hmm. And you're like, why does my neck hurt? Mm -hmm. Right? So that's a smita. So that's a klesha. Um, and then we have raga. So raga is like a craving, it's like an attachment to. Um, and there's to, uh, two yoga sutras that speak of this as well, um, besides the one that I just chanted. It's uh, sukha nushai ragaha, dukha nushai dveshaha. So sukha, if you hear any sort of like sukham, anything, is kind of a blanket term. It's like good, pleasant, wonderful in Sanskrit. Um, what do you say? Positive. Oh, positive. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Positive, yeah. happy. Yeah, you hear sukham a lot. You hear sukham a lot. Um, and then, do, no, awesome. awesome. Thank you. Contribution. <laughs> great. He's in the moment. I love that. All right. Yeah. <laughs> And then dukkha is like unpleasant, like, mm, like uh, hard to deal with, like, um, or even it could be kind of like a tamas of the mind, like a kind of cloudiness of the mind. And sukham is like a lightness as well. Um, so uh, if you have, so it's, it's natural to have a craving for something. If you're hungry, right? You're sitting at the end of uh, like Shavasana or like in meditation and your stomach rumbles. You're like, you know what would be nice? Fried chicken or like whatever, <laughs> a Sunday, like whatever comes up, um, you know, like that, that's natural um, to fulfill your needs, certainly, right? But uh, when you allow that craving to overtake you, and, and you start associating that with the emotional state that you'll have afterwards, then that thing owns you, right? Yeah. So raga is not like, oh, don't crave for anything. At least, it, again, this is my translation. I'm not like the be all end all. What feels true for you in your body? Um, but it's natural to have cravings for certain things. But when they overtake you or when they're not serving you in your life, then, then that uh, can become an obstacle to happiness, right? So, so we have avidya, asmita, raga, and then we have that next one, which is dvesha, which was in that second yoga sutra I mentioned. So, dukkha nushai dveshaha. So, if the first yoga sutra was saying like, ah, we're running towards the things that are pleasant too much, that's going to cause pain. What do you think the second one says? Running away, right? And that will cause dukkha. Yeah, pain. Exactly. Yeah. So now, uh, raise your hand if you've been through one of my programs. Okay. All right. Okay. Or if you're in one of my programs. Okay. <laughs> okay. And maybe some of the people that just kind of like know me personally. Um, I invite the people around me to show up and face their fears. I invite my students to walk through their fear and to walk through their pain because it can be a great teacher. And so often, and like I catch myself too because it's human nature, it's human nature to run away from that which is unpleasant, right? We're so like spoiled in this world, right? We're so like, um, you know, if you go to Starbucks, uh, which I, I don't really go to often anymore because it really makes me jittery. But like you hear people's orders, like I want three pumps of like the, the vanilla and I want like just a squirt of the whipped cream and I want like three and a half packets of stevia. And then I want like just a sprinkle of cinnamon mocha. Like it just, it gets ridiculous. Like if you see the receipts on some of these things, it's like, like that is how our preferences are. 
And the thing is, and, and again, like Raga and Devesha are very connected because you have the craving for the thing. And if you don't have it, then like you're, how dare them? First of all, that sprinkle of cinnamon is not big enough. Like, how dare them? Like, that's how spoiled we are. So, you know, Devesha, it's like we're running away from these things that are causing us pain. The thing is, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, for us to grow, we need to be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? I wish that wasn't the case. I don't know, but it is, right? So you can't grow without some discomfort, whether it's the sort of mental discomfort of like, oh, I've never done this before. Here I am today, slightly uncomfortable in front of everyone that's looking at me, right? But I'm here and I have self-soothing mechanisms and I have shraddha. I have faith knowing that I can get through it. But so aversion is natural. And if we have that pause, if we have our yogic tools to be able to take a pause and not react and listen to the stories of the mind, then we can learn to walk through the fire and use reasonable pain as a means of purification. Facing our fears can be satisfying. There's a quote by Patanjali and it's, um, you know, when you're guided by a great purpose, gifts and talents you never realized come to the surface and you become a person far greater than what you ever dreamed yourself to be. Do you think that happens from staying in your comfort zone? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that comes from remembering who you are, remembering your strength, remembering that you can handle it and choosing to walk through. Our ability to walk through our own discomfort allows us to be compassionate for others. And the kind of compassion where we don't feel like we need to rescue them. Because that can be an act of violence, yeah? People need to have, people have their own battles. People have their own challenges that they need to walk through. And if we think that other people shouldn't suffer, I mean, that's a kind gesture. But like everybody does at a certain, to a certain extent. If we can stay connected, stay connected to our true nature with less distortion, we can see reality as it really is. We can walk through the flames. And that's how we become leaders in our communities. Guiding people through discomfort and doing so compassionately, because there's a difference. Because there's plenty of people that can guide people into pain and like just check out and not have, you know, have any sort of compassionate connection to heart. But I have found that to guide people through the discomfort of themselves compassionately, you need to have walked that road yourself. You need to do that practice yourself. And sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes it's necessary to feel what you need to feel to go through it and release it. So the Vesha, if we're avoiding it too much, we're stealing away, right, Asteya, stealing away our chance to become the person that our mind can't even think of, which is great. Our last klesha, Abhinivesha, Abhinivesha. So Abhinivesha, the translation of that is a clinging to life. So clinging to life, um, the magnitude of death, like if you've been around and have lost people, many of us have, you know, the magnitude of that is you're never prepared for it, right? Like you think you are, but you're not fully because it's so, it seems so final, at least from the human form. You know, um, I lost my mother in 2021 um, and I remember very clearly when it happened 
Um, you know, I dropped my knees and I screamed out loud. It was, you know, sh shocked my nervous system because in my mind, it wasn't part of the plan. It wasn't part of the plan. She was supposed to be here. When I, and this is Abhini Vesha in practice, practical application. If I continue to think, no, it shouldn't have happened. That should not have, she should, she was stolen from me. She should be here still. That causes me great pain. I'm clinging to her life. But if I think it happened in its time, and luckily I got to see her the day before she died, which is a gift I'll never forget. But because I released that, I'm able to think about her and connect with her in the spiritual realm. And I know that she's with me always and she's with me here today. But if I was still clinging to her bodily form, I might not be able to tap into that, you know? We are not of this body. You're not your mind. You're not your thoughts. You're not your body. You're the consciousness that pulses through, that connects all of us. You are a drop in the ocean, a wave rising up from the ocean to express, to crest, to sing your song, and then you go back in. When you have that idea, when you know in your heart that that is true or something like that, um, you fear death less, and you're willing to take more risks in your life. Another definition of Abhini Vesha is like a clinging to your way of life. So um, sometimes in life, things just happen. Boom, 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 right? Like one after the other. It's where you're like, damn, what kind of karma am I working out this lifetime? Really? Really? <laughs> sometimes life is like that. If we can trust, stay engaged in life and stay present, and remember that we have the strength to get through it, that the God universe will not hand you anything that you cannot handle, and that you have what it takes to walk through, then that can help to give you a sense of peace and connection again. That takes something called tapas, which is delicious little appetizer place that they serve. <laughs> Tapas, <laughs> which is inner austerities, that fire, that discipline. Um, swadhyaya, which is self-study. Self-study. So studying ourselves, studying spiritual scripture, introspection, and some might even say to be in nature. Swadhyaya. And then the last one, Ishwara Pranidana. So Ishwara is surrender, letting go, um, allowing this force of wisdom and connection to enter us, to remember, to let go of our worldly problems, to surrender it so that we can find peace. If we have those three aspects of the upper limbs of the niyamas, this is our internal work. Discipline, show up for yourself. Why? Because you're worth it. It's not even, not even about you. There are people waiting to hear your voice in your community or in your family. Children, brothers, sisters, family, friends, maybe even people you don't even know. I've been podcasting for 10 years and sometimes I'll get an email from someone way off in some other country. I'm like, I had no idea you were listening. Thank you for the email though. You never know. You never know whose life you're going to impact. Having the discipline to do your work, to show up for yourself, to share your voice, to share your gifts. Because they might not just be for you. You have to share your toys. Swadhyaya, study yourself so you can remember who you are, so you can know who you are. And if like introspection is difficult, get some scripture that you resonate with. Again, don't take my word for it. Go where your heart is called. And then you got to let stuff go. Release expectations. Let things go. Surrender to a higher power. Take the weight off your shoulders. You don't have to carry it all. These three upper limbs, these help us to be 
like a yoga warrior to show up, to do the work and to make change in our communities, to be an inspiration and to do so with compassion and love. So close your eyes, take some deep breaths. Inhale and exhale. Papas, Swadhyaya. Ishwara Pranidana. Tapas Swadhyaya. Ishwara Pranidana. Tapas Swadhyaya. Ishwara Pranidana. Tapasya, Swadhyaya, Ishwara, Pranidhanani. Tapasya. <laughs> Let me repeat after me. <laughs> Tapasya, Swadhyaya. Ishwara Pranidana Ni Tapasya Swadhyaya Ishwara Pranidana Ni Oh Tapasya Swadhyaya Ishwara Pranidana Ni. All right. We're going to piece it together now. You know the words. Here we go. Oh, Tapas Ya Swadhyaya. Ishwara Pranidana Ni O Tapas Yaswadhyaya Ishwara Pranidana Ni O Tapas Yaswadhyaya Ishwara Pranidana Ni O Tapas Yaswadhyaya Ishwara Pranidana Ni do you remember what we chanted before? We'll do a little review. Avidya, Asmita, Raga, Dvisha. There's a little D in there. Dvisha, Apini Vesha. Plesha. One more time. Avidya. Smita. Raga. Dvesha. Abhini Vesha. Plesha. All right, we're going to go through it. We're going to piece together. Just sing along. Do your best. Here we go. Avidya smita raga. Dvisha abhini vesha klesha vidya smita raga. Dvisha abhini vesha klesha vidya smita raga. Dvisha abhini vesha klesho tapas yaswadhyaya. 
Ishwara Prani Dana Neo Tapas Yaswa Yaya Ishwara Prani Dana Neo Tapas Yaswa Yaya Last one Ishwara Prani Dana Neo Vidya Smita Raga Dvishta Abhini Vesha Klesha Vidya Smita Raga Dvishta Abhini Vesha Klesha Vidya Smita Raga Dvishta Abhini Vesha Klesha Tapa Jaswadhyaya Ishwara Pranidana Neo Tapas Yaswadhyaya Ishwara Pranidana Neo Tapas Yaswadhyaya Ishwara Pranidana Neo Vidyasmita Raga Vesha Akhini Vesha Klesha Vidya Smita Raga Vesha Akhini Vesha Klesha Vidya Smita Raga Vesha Akhini Vesha Klesha So beautiful, <laughs> so elegant, just looking like a wow. So beautiful, so elegant, just looking like a wow. Oh. Breathe, Kaya Gatta Veda Nasati. Feel the experience of energy flowing through your body from within the framework of your body. So we'll take just a little meditation here, if you allow everything to kind of sink in and you might hear a little bit of flute you might hear a little bit of extra chanting and i'll let you know when to come out of it so just get yourself comfortable we won't be here long just a few minutes
Swaha Tat Savitur Varenyam Bargo Devasya Di Mahi Dio Yona Prachotaya Two more ohms. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. When you're ready, you can slowly open up your eyes. Thank you so much, everybody. Namaste. <laughs>